I'm just going to jump right in tonight. Let me ask you a question. What is the number one reason that people give as to why they are uninterested in becoming a Christian? Think about that for a moment. What's the number one reason that people give as to why they're uninterested in becoming a Christian? Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. An old German philosopher named Hein, he said, show me your redeemed life, and I might be inclined to believe in your Redeemer. An Indian philosopher named Bara Dada said, Jesus is ideal and wonderful, but you Christians, you are not like Him. When the actions of Christians don't back up what they say they believe, then unbelievers discredit the message because of the messenger. And that's why the single greatest tool of evangelism It's how you live your life. Our actions are the most powerful tool that we have to persuade people to believe our message about Jesus, to believe the gospel. And the opposite is also true. The single greatest deterrent to evangelism is our lack of backing up what we proclaim with our actions. Brennan Manning said this years ago. He said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. The unbelieving world gets most of what they know about Jesus and what they know about the gospel from the actions of of Christians. They read us way more than they read the Bible. They only hear about Jesus, but they see us. But the problem is, is that many of us speak so loudly by what we do that no one can even begin to hear what we have to say. So I ask you tonight, does your life point people to Jesus? When the lost world looks at you, do they see Jesus in you? Do your actions bring people closer to Christ, or do they push people away from Him? So tonight we're continuing our series in 1 Peter. The series is called The Power of Hope. We're starting into a new section tonight called Silencing the Critics. Silencing the Critics. There have been and will continue to be plenty of critics of Christianity. The question is, are your actions silencing them or are your actions adding more fuel to the fire? And so as we jump into this new section about silencing the critics, tonight we're going to talk, kind of see an overview of what Christian good works are all about. And so the title of the message tonight is Godly Living. Godly living. Let's pick back up in 1 Peter in our study. Chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 11 and 12 tonight. It says, Dear friends, Peter is going to kind of butter them up before he gives them a, a nice command here. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. So that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. What a great passage. I want you to see two things tonight about good works. First, I want you to see the process of good works. The process of good works. Now, pretty much anything of value takes some time and effort to put into it. And good works for a Christian are no exception to that. It's not easy to do good works. They don't happen by accident. It's a process. And so Peter, in this passage, gives us three steps in this process of good works in the life of a believer in Jesus. So step number one is that being 
precedes doing. Being precedes doing. He starts verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles. Now, Peter's already used both of these descriptions for believers back in chapter 1. And so he's reminding us yet again that God has taken people that used to be at home in this sinful world, and he has made us aliens and exiles in this world. We've been called out of this world. We've been redeemed. We've been changed. We've been born again. But there is an enormous link here to the previous two verses. Verses 9 and 10 are so vital to understanding verses 11 and 12. So let me back up and refresh your memory from last week. Verse 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, this is who we are. This is who we've been made to be by our new birth. Your past sins, your past failures, your past mistakes, they no longer define you. This is what defines you. Christ defines you. You are His. So verses 9 and 10, and then the beginning of here, verse 11, are all about being. It's about who we are. And in the Bible, being always precedes doing. It's so important. And Peter could have very well put a therefore at the beginning of verse 11. He very well could have said, in light of you being a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession, recipients of mercy... Therefore, behave this way. Therefore, do these things. So the point is, is that we do good works because of who we are in Christ. We do good works because of what He's done for us. If our being doesn't precede our doing, then our doing is going to be weak. And it's going to be for the wrong reasons, the wrong motivation. And see, our good works are meant to be an expression, even a celebration of our acceptance with God, not the means of achieving that acceptance with God. And so it's because of who we are in Christ that we are called to behave differently. We're called to respond with graciousness. We're called to forgive. We're called to love our enemies. Now, a few years ago, I saw a company that was using a slogan. This was their slogan. Go, do, be. Three words. Go, do, be. Now, at first glance, if you were to see that, you may not think too much about it. But if you really look at it, and you really think through what that is communicating, that is a classic example of a lie of the enemy that creeps into our thinking and can ultimately end up destroying our lives. You see, go, do, be is really a core belief about what makes us who we are. This slogan tells us that doing precedes being, that who you are is determined by what you do, that your identity comes from your actions. This is exactly the opposite of what God teaches us all throughout Scripture. Let's just take what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 20. Jesus says, In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you will recognize them by their fruit. So fruit doesn't make a tree a tree. So therefore, good fruit doesn't make a tree good. Good fruit is the way that we know that the tree is good, that it's healthy. It's the evidence. The fruit 
proves the root. You heard that before? The fruit proves the root. And so in the same way, good works don't make you God's chosen possession. Rather, they identify that you are God's chosen possession. Being comes before doing. So it's not what you do that determines what you are, who you are, but rather it's who you are that determines what you do. Your identity is found in whose you are, not in your actions. And so don't believe the lie that is so tempting every single day that you live as a Christian. Don't believe the lie that your acceptance from God is determined by your actions. Because it's not. And it's amazing that it's not. Your acceptance from God is determined not by your actions, but by Jesus' actions. And His actions are perfectly perfect. And so when you place your faith in Jesus, your judgment day moves from the future to the past. Romans 8 chapter 1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your sin has been taken care of. Your punishment has been taken care of. Your guilt has been taken care of. Your shame has been taken care of. All of those things in verses 9 and 10 are true about you. Why? Because Jesus has purchased your salvation with his blood on the cross. And it's because of the incredible news of the gospel that we do good works. And so either Jesus makes a believer discontent with sin, or sin makes a fake Christian discontent with Jesus. The fruit proves the root. So step one, being precedes doing. Step two, fight with your flesh. You have to fight against your flesh. Peter writes, dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. So if you're going to have good works in your life, it starts with being, it starts with who you are in Christ, and then next, you have to go to battle. You have to go to battle. So who are we to war against? The liberals? <laughs> Corrupt leaders? Enemies of the gospel? How about those who are persecuting us? That's not who we're told to go to war against. You see, who Peter tells us to go to war against is not all of those people. He says to go to war against ourselves. Ourselves. You see, there's a spiritual war that's already going on. Not only is it all around us, even though we can't see it, but that spiritual battle is inside of us as well. When you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live within you, and you become a new creation. But that old sinful nature, that flesh, is still present. And so the war waging going on inside of you every single day and really every moment of the day is between the Spirit of God inside of you versus your flesh, that fleshly, sinful nature. So you're at war with the flesh, and it truly is a battle for your soul. You see, these sinful passions will destroy your life. They will destroy your life. If you let them reign in your life with no repentance. So therefore, we fight. We fight. And Peter is calling us to fight with our flesh by abstaining from sinful desires. And so this fight is more about inward discipline than it is outward physical action. It's about killing sin. Say, well, what exactly are these sinful desires? Other translations call them passions of the flesh or fleshly lusts. 
Now, some people just take this and they think that he's only talking about sexual sin, but that's not the case. This is not referencing just sexual sin. That's part of it, but it's much bigger than that. Rather, it's any desire that comes from our fallen nature. So greed, lust, gossip, pride, anger, revenge. And that Peter's already given us a list of sins to throw off. Back in verse 1 of chapter, chapter 2, he says, throw off malice and hypocrisy and deceit and envy and slander. Have you ever heard, or maybe you've even said it yourself, that you gave in to sin because you just couldn't help yourself? Now, even if you've never said it, we're probably all guilty of at least thinking it, trying to rationalize our sin through that. I want you to think about it right now. Is that true? Is that ever true for a Christian? Is there ever a time where you don't have a choice, where the temptation is so great that you don't have a choice that you have to give in? Yeah, the answer is no. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. See, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are children of God who have the spirit of God, and we are equipped to battle against our flesh. That means that we can abstain from these passions that will destroy us. So as a Christian, like we looked at last week, you exist to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So these sinful desires are anything that pulls you away from marveling at the excellencies of Jesus. They cause you to stop doing what you were created to do. They cause you to begin to love other things more than you love Jesus. So how exactly do we fight with our flesh? Well, God shows us that there are two steps in fighting against these sinful desires. The first is very practical. It's putting safeguards in place. Putting safeguards in place. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 through 30, Jesus talks about this. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one part of your body than for all of your body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So you can cut off your hand. You can gouge out your eye. That means taking practical, sometimes drastic, but needed steps, practical steps to stop yourself from falling into sin. It means to put safeguards in place. It means to get accountability in your life. It means to guard your eyes. It means to take steps to kill the sin in your life. I love what John Owen said. He said, you better be killing sin or it's going to be killing you. So in other words, Jesus is saying, if you don't want to fall, then you don't walk in slippery places. That's the first step that we see in Scripture. The second step that we see is to replace that sinful desire. Boy, this is big replace that sinful desire. You see, once you have pushed a sin out of your life, it's going to leave a void. And you have to fill that void with something else or that sin is going to creep back in. And so what do you fill that void with? As a Christian, you fill that void with worshiping Jesus. That's exactly what Peter's already been talking about in his letter. Back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, he's talking about set your hope fully on the Lord. 
set your hope fully on Christ. And then as we talked about a few weeks ago, back in chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, to crave the Word of God. Crave the Word of God. So the principle is the closer we are to Jesus, the further we will be from sin. George Mueller was a German who started an orphanage in England back in the 1800s. Some amazing stories about George Mueller. But I just want to share a quote with you tonight from, from him. He said, I have learned that the first and great primary business to which I ought to attend to every day is to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about is not how much I might serve the Lord or how I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and my inner man might be nourished. George Mueller learned the secret to walking in the spirit, as the Bible calls it. He learned the secret to fighting the flesh. And the secret is to meditate and rest in the love and the promises of God. Rest in the gospel of Jesus Christ every single morning until... Your heart is happy in Him. Boy, that's huge. You fight for your soul by taking action against temptation and replacing that evil fleshly desire with desires for Christ. Galatians 5, 16 says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. So being precedes doing. And then we want to fight with our flesh. And then the third step here of the process of good works is to love others. Love others. Look back at our text. It says, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, and we'll pause right there for a moment. Now it seems like every single week, I go back and I mention who Peter is writing to. And that's important. It's so important to understand the initial audience because that unlocks so much of the Scripture. That unlocks so much of what Peter is writing here. You see, these Christians, I'll remind you again, they were being beaten. They were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus. They were being murdered. Now, the Christians were already disliked in Rome because they were so countercultural. They weren't like the other people. But then you have the Emperor Nero who blames these fires of Rome on them, and this intense persecution erupts in Rome and it spreads out to all these other areas. And that's when we begin to see Christians being rolled in pitch and set on fire to be used as living torches. We see that many were wrapped in animal skins and then hunted by wild dogs that would tear them into pieces. Many were nailed to crosses. Many were lynched without trial. Many were imprisoned and scourged and stoned and lacerated with hot knives and thrown onto the horns of bulls. They were being slandered. They were being persecuted for these deadly fires that they didn't have anything to do with. That's the background for Peter calling them to fight against their fleshly desires and now to conduct themselves honorably among the Gentiles. Now, Peter doesn't just use the normal Greek word for good here when he's talking about their conduct. It's not just, hey, good conduct with with the Gentiles. Peter goes way further than that. He goes beyond the typical moral goodness, and he uses a term here that means attractive or beautiful or honorable. It's one of the most difficult words in Greek because it's so deep in meaning. But basically, he's saying that our behavior towards unbelievers should be honorable and it should be attractive. So we're to wage war not against our persecutors, not against our slanderers, but we're to wage war against ourselves. And then we're to have honorable character, honorable conduct towards everyone, including our persecutors and our slanderers. 
Can you imagine being in their shoes? That means no revenge. No retaliation. No payback. They just burned my family member alive and used them as a human torch. And Peter, you want me to not fight against them, but to fight against myself? And you want me to have attractive, beautiful conduct towards them? See, this is the way we fight our battles with others. It's through beautiful, attractive, honorable conduct that points people to the beauty of Jesus. So here God is calling these Christians and he's calling us today to treat all unbelievers with love. To be a positive, proactive force for good in our relationships and in this community and ultimately in the entire world world. You see, we're to show the culture around us that we are honest, that we are just, that we are compassionate, that we are kind, that we are gentle, that we are full of love because Jesus is honest. Jesus is just and Jesus is compassionate and he is kind and gentle and he is full of love. And so we're called to help the hurting. We're called to feed the hungry. We're called to take care of the widows and orphans and others in need. To pay back evil with good. To forgive others. All, all of that because Jesus has done this and way more for us. Can I tell you something tonight? Being easily offended is not a fruit of the Spirit. Being easily offended at everything that happens to you or everything that happens in the world or even in the church, that is not what the Spirit of God produces in our lives. The Spirit of God produces love and joy and peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control towards even those who are persecuting and slandering us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 46 and 47 says, For if you love those who love you, this is what Jesus says, If you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? How is your love for others? How is your love for people that wrong you? How is your love for people that talk bad about you? Being precedes doing. Fight against your flesh and love others. That's the process of good works in the life of a true believer in Jesus. So first, we saw the process of good works. Secondly, I want us to see the product of good works. The product of good works. Look at verse 12 again. It says, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. So this world will slander us. This world will call us evil. But when your actions point people to the beauty of Jesus, even in the face of that evil, even in the face of that calling us evil and slandering us, when your actions point people to the beauty of Jesus, that's when we see the product of good works come forth. That's when we see the result of good works. And so good works help produce a change. It helps produce a flipping of the script, a turning of the tables in people's lives. Your honorable deeds help to flip the slander of us into worship of God. Think about this. When the world slanders us, does evil to us, and then sees us loving them anyway... 
That is a powerful testimony to Christ. And that's a testimony that won't go unnoticed. You see, there's a cycle here that we're slandered, and then we respond with more good deeds, then they will recognize our good deeds, and then lastly, they will glorify God. So how exactly does someone go from slandering a Christian to glorifying God? That's a big jump, isn't it? Now, Peter gives us more details in other parts of the letter. So in this same chapter, a couple verses later that we'll look at next week, Lord willing, Peter says, it's God's will that you silence, that you silence the ignorant, the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. So the pattern is that when we respond to slander and hate with love and good works, the slanderer becomes silent. And then in chapter 3, verse 16, it says, give a defense with gentleness and reverence, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. So when we respond with love and good works, not only will many of the slanderers be silenced, but also many will be put to shame. That means that they'll recognize what they were doing was wrong. Then the last part of verse 12 here says, they will glorify God on the day he visits. Peter is saying that all of this is going to happen on the day that God visits them. Now, that's somewhat of a strange phrase, but it's actually used all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, and pretty much every time it always references salvation. So he's not talking about when Jesus returns in the future. He's not talking about the second coming of Christ. He's talking about salvation, when God visits them, when they become Christians. And so we, too, we used to be just like these slanderers. But now we've been born again, and we see things totally different. Because when you're reborn, you see God as glorious rather than foolish. And you see Christians as family rather than evil people to slander. When God comes to visit, they are now part of the chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession, recipients of mercy. They've been called out of darkness and into marvelous light. And so now they're the ones proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus. That's how you go from a slanderer to a worshiper. Titus chapter 2, verse 8 says, Your message is to be sound beyond reproach, so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Here's the key. Here's the key. Peter is saying that God uses our good works. He uses our fighting against our flesh. He uses our loving of others in practical ways. He uses all of that. To help people move from slanderers of God to worshipers of God. That means that your personal battle with sin, your fight with your flesh, your loving and serving others is about more than just you. Because God can use your actions to play a part in the salvation of others, especially those who slander and mistreat you. There was a couple named Herb and Ruth Klingen. They were missionaries serving in the Philippines during World War II. They were captured and they were held as prisoners by the Japanese at an internment camp, basically a concentration camp. This couple witnessed countless murders. People starved to death. People tortured They recorded some of these horrors in a diary book. And one of the main figures in that diary book was a man named Konishi. Konishi was the most ruthless and brutal of all of the Japanese authorities. All of the soldiers that were there at that camp, he was the worst. 
He would starve people on purpose. He would shoot people through the head. He would do all sorts of horrible, unbelievable things that they wrote down. Konishi was so evil that he would actually invent new ways of torturing the prisoners. One time he decided to increase their food rations. That sounds good, right? But he did it with unhusked rice. And so eating the rice with its razor-sharp husk would cause intestinal bleeding and would kill these weakened prisoners within hours. And so Konishi was forcing them to choose. You can eat the unhusked rice and you can bleed to death internally. You cannot eat the rice and you can starve to death. Or you can spend all of your energy unhusking the rice and still potentially die. That's the type of torture that was commonplace. That's what he did until February 24, 1945, the very day that Konishi had said that he planned to finish off and kill all the remaining prisoners at that camp. That day, they were liberated by troops led by the American general, Douglas MacArthur. Flash forward a few years later. Konishi was found. He fled, hid, He was finally found working as a groundskeeper at a golf course in Manila. He was put on trial for his war crimes, and he was executed. But before his execution, this man professed faith in Christ. And you know what he said? He said he'd been deeply affected by the testimony of the Christian missionaries that he had persecuted. That's amazing, isn't it? This man, so full of evil, was impacted. The Lord used the testimony of people just like Herb and Ruth Klingen for him to see the true Christ, for him to see what Jesus was really all about. God can use your good works to silence the critics and even bring them to saving faith in Christ. So I ask you tonight, how is your life, how are your actions impacting people's view of Jesus? Pray with me. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the principles that are there, God, that are so helpful to us. Lord, that we know who we are in Christ. Lord, that you have saved us and redeemed us. You've called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. So now, Lord, because of that, because of salvation, because of the gospel, Lord, we do good works. We abstain from our sinful desires. Lord, we have honorable conduct, conduct that makes you look beautiful to people that are even slandering and persecuting us. Lord, help us to fight with our flesh, to abstain from those sinful desires, and Lord, to share your love with other people. And then, Lord, we'll get the joy of sitting back and being able to watch and see you use our feeble good works to use them to impact all of eternity. God, thank you for the gospel. Lord, even when our good works fail, Lord, we thank you that because of Christ, Lord, we are accepted in your sight, just like we've always perfectly obeyed. Lord, make us a people that share your love with others. Lord, in practical ways, by telling them the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray.